Hey everyone. Thank you so much for being here. You are on a cool season gardening webinar hosted by 5B Resilience Gardens. Um, Mano and I are representatives and we'll give you a brief intro shortly. I just wanted to quickly go over our agenda for the day. So like I said, we'll do presenter introductions. We'll give you a really quick overview of what 5B Resilience Garden is, then we'll jump into the bulk of the material focused on cool season gardening. So we'll tell you what cool season gardening is, some considerations and benefits, how you prepare your garden for growing in the early spring, um, and a, lots of lists of cool season plants. And we can go into depth on those plants if they're of interest to people. Um, and then we also if it's of interest can go into seed preparations and spring maintenance. We kind of want to play it by ear by what people are um, on the call interested in talking about because there, as you know, a lot to talk about with gardening. Um, and then we'll share some events with you all. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Mano to introduce herself first. Okay, I don't want to say much about me because it's all about plants, but I'm a master <laughs> gardener. I've been uh, growing a garden here for 11 years now. And my interest was first when uh, my first grandson was born and I thought I ought to be able to teach my grandkids all about gardening. So here I am. Oh, that's a short one today. Okay, thanks, Manel. <laughs> I'm Amy Mateus. I'll keep it short as well. I'm the program director for the Sun Valley Institute for Resilience. So a lot of you know me from local food alliance work this is an initiative that we started um, around COVID last year. So I've been gardening in Haley since 2016. Um, I grew up in a gardening family, but it was one where like my parents, their, their gardening time was adult time. So kids weren't actually allowed in the garden, which was kind of sad. And coming back to it as an adult has been really enjoyable. And I love getting my hands dirty and eating fresh stuff out of the garden and watching all the winged creatures fly around out there. Um, so 5B Resilience Gardens is really a collaboration between a lot of entities in our community. And like I said, we started it during COVID because we saw a huge interest in gardening, like seeds were selling out, people more than ever before were interested in gardening, and that has actually not dissipated. The trend is staying strong this year. Um, so we're really excited to bring resources to our community, to create a network of gardeners, to share resources, share tools, share food. Um, and share the camaraderie that is gardening because it's really fun when we can do it together. Uh, so we have a few just guiding principles about gardening. If you want to learn about these guiding principles, we're doing an upcoming series with the Haley Public Library. We'll have details about those dates at the end. Um, but our guiding principles are food production, pollinator habitat, and soil care. And we believe gardening is any level of crop production from container gardeners to a big multi-acre garden down on a Bellevue property where you have a lot of space to garden and a lot of sunlight. Um, we do say to limit or not use chemical inputs. That's really to protect the soil, to pr protect pollinators and to protect ourselves. Um, it may incorporate native plants, but it's not required. There are a lot of delicious edible native plants a lot of native plants that are great for wildlife, but a lot of food production gardeners are focused primarily on um, vegetable crops. So we want to include everyone in there. Um, and we also think about water-wise techniques because we live in a high desert climate. So it's important for us to conserve water, to be thoughtful with the use and make it last. Um, so that's just a little bit about 5B Resilience Gardens. And now we'll jump into, cool. Manel, go ahead. I'd like to talk to the picture. Um, sure. Picture on the right is your garden, right? Yes. And the picture on the left is my garden uh, either last year or two years ago. And this is my front, the front of my house. It used to be lawn and I converted it to a xeriscape with uh, beds that run all along my patio. And so you can see here in the forefront, there's a oregano that's really plentiful and comes back year to year, amazingly. There's a bean plant growing there on the left. There's a koji berry plant. There's chives in there. Um, there's lots of flowers, perennials and uh, annual flowers. In the background on the trellis are peas. And then on the right in the background are all the pots where I grow herbs. 
So it's, I have relatively a small gardening space, but it's amazing how many things you can grow in a small space. Thanks for that overview, Manel. It's so fun to see the way that you incorporate layers, right? Because gardening, if you don't have a lot of horizontal space, you definitely have vertical space. So how can we grow up is something I think about a lot. And I think a lot of suburban, urban gardeners think about that too. So it's a really lovely display of that. I won't go into details on my picture, but it's delicious strawberries in a multicultural bed, which is really fun. So there's a lot going on in the bed. And if you're interested, I'm happy to talk to you about establishing something like that. Um, okay, so cool season gardening. Cool season gardening really is about soil temperature. So we have frost that can come all year long. We often say like the last frost is June 1st or around that time, but we can get stuff planted now. And that's usually called cool season gardening. So um, we have a lot of sunlight available to us, but the outdoor day temperatures are above freezing most days. If it goes below freezing for a long period of time, you're not gonna get beautiful radishes like that because they will freeze, but you can protect them um, and keep them safe, which is nice. So we really like cool season gardening because we live in a colder climate. So if we were only warm season gardening, it would be a really short season and we might not have a ton of successes growing a lot of tomatoes, squash, peppers, things like that. But our cool season plants, um, they do well here. So better, we, than, better than in the south of Idaho. In the right. south of Idaho, they do better with warm season vegetables. But here, because our nights are so cool, uh, we do better with cold season vegetables. Yeah, and we have one gardener on who's up and over Galena Pass in an area that cool season is probably her safest choice for actually producing crops year round, or I'm sorry, season long throughout the growing season. But you can grow warmer crops too, and we'll have an upcoming webinar about that closer to June um, to dive deep into tomatoes and peppers because we like growing those things. But the cool season crops definitely are um, your surest way to get a harvest. They're also like radishes, they can produce quickly. So if you were to plant something now, you can be eating out of your garden in a month, six weeks, uh, which is really nice because compared to like conventional thought, you wouldn't even be planting in your garden for six weeks, right? So cool season definitely allows that season extension to happen. Anything you wanna add, Mano, before we no, jump to soil all prep? The, all of the Asian greens, uh, can can be grown here at this time, and they're short, they they grow really fast. Mm -hmm. And you can start your culinary herbs now. And um, there's so much. There's if you have perennials, um, pretty soon the sorrel plants will be up and will be eating sorrel out of the garden. The chives mm -hmm. will soon be up. The green onions will soon soon be up. So it it's amazing um, how how much we can get early in the season. The farmer's market starts only in May or, or, or June. June. Mm -hmm. So this, this time of the year until the farmer's market start is, is really, it's hard to get fresh local vegetables. So growing your own is the best way to, to get fresh local things right now. And they're, they're easy, they're easy to grow. Uh -huh. And they taste good. I mean, some of my favorite foods are cool season crops. Um, and we'll get into lists of cool season crops because there's a lot that we can plant and we'll talk about um, all of those shortly. But first, we're going to talk about how do you prep your growing space or how do you know if your soil is ready to plant in? Um, we talk about this a lot. Soil temperatures. Check your soil temp. So you can see these are two types of thermometers. They go right into the soil. You want a at least a couple inches probe so you can see like how you know how deep can you get it because if it's frozen solid two inches down it's probably not ready to plant in yet so you definitely want a little depth um, and you want a soil temperature above 40 is minimum to plant we said here between 45 and 65 and that's really the the range you'll get the most germination happening in so in comparison to peppers or tomatoes if some of you all have experience starting those, like you put a heat mat under your seed tray, right? To keep that soil warm, cool season crops don't need it. So um, that's really nice for our cooler uh, 
Mano, did you take this temperature in your garden recently, or do you know what your soil temp is right now? I, it, my soil is still frozen in most places. I did mm -hmm. not uh, do the temperature, but uh, pretty soon I know it'll be around 40. Yeah. It yeah. Probably by the first week of April, would you say is a safe time to really start temping that soil? Well, I, 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 I notice where my um, snow recedes first. So that's an indication that that's a warmer area. Mm -hmm. that's a microclimate. So we have to define our microclimates in our garden and, and take advantage of them and reserve your warmest areas for maybe this uh, warm season vegetables. But you could be planting some cold season vegetables that grow fast, like radishes and some greens right now before you, you go to, into the warm season. But the, mm -hmm. the first thing in the spring, and, uh, and I would start at this time because you see how, how the snow recedes. And as, as soon as the soil is not frozen anymore, you dip your thermometer in there and you define the, different, the, the differences between your microclimates, your different areas in your gardens. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to increase the warmth. So we often um, promote mulching. It's a really great way to protect soil, to build organic matter, to reduce erosion, to um, infiltrate water, but it can keep your soils cool. So if you have a spot like for instance, if you wanted to plant some peas right here, oh, sorry, when I move my mouse, it also moves my slideshow, apologies for that. Um, if you were to move some mulch away to get more sunlight directly on the dark soil, it'll heat it up faster. You can also do this with a microclimate like that milk jug, that's gonna warm everything within the milk jug a lot faster than the surrounding plants. You can also solarize with black plastic um, Mano and I don't use that technique often, but a lot of um, commercial growers or people that are really driven by yield and productivity and efficiency would use black plastic and you would put it out. You could put it over snow to help melt the snow. You can just put it over soil to help um, warm up that soil before planting. Some people, as you may see, like actually cut holes in black plastic and plant right into that that's not great for cool season gardening because that soil is going to end up being too hot for those plants. Um, so this is like remove after the soil is warm, the black plastic. And you have to be careful not to leave your plastic too long because if it's moist and warm under there, it's going to go moldy, which you may not want. Uh, another way that I use a lot is to use warm water to water your soil. So I collect, every time I wash vegetables, I reserve my Water, rinsing water, I put it in a jug and I go put that outside on my beds where I want to warm up my beds. So that's a great way of, of warming up your, your soil also. And I would say the opposite is true too. If you do have to water early because you have some seedlings and like we've had a very dry spring. So if you have to get some seedlings established, watering with cold water will cool your soil off. Um, if it's close to freezing at night, cold water can promote freezing in the soil. So be mindful of that. Like a lot of water straight out of the spigot is going to be really cold this time of year. Um, so it might be helpful to like fill up a watering can and put it in the sun um, or put it in your house so it gets to room temperature before watering plants because the cold water can be very damaging. But it and can then, be useful. Cold water can be useful later in the season. If it gets too warm and you see that your plants want to start bolting, mm -hmm. water them with cold water to keep their feet cold and it will slow down the bolting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Mano mentioned to me last week, like she moved some snow onto a part of her yard that was already melted off because she didn't want the soil to be bare there yet. So she actually moved snow from a pile of snow in one place and spread it out a little and that'll help it melt more evenly. So your soil temp is gonna be more even because it's got the insulation from the snow and it's slowly infiltrating that water as it melts. Okay, so the next part of kind of preparing the growing space is protecting plants. So we talked about this a little bit in our last class on different kind of materials you can use to protect things. Um, 
as you can see, like we talked about a plastic jug, a yogurt container, all sorts of nifty things that are in your house that are usually, you know, trash or recycling, ideally, um, those can be repurposed. You can also buy fancy things like water walls, which will be kind of tubes of plastic that contain water in them. And that water is either warm when you put it in or you warm it up by the sun and that creates a little circle of warmth around a plant to protect it. Um, cold frames are another form of protecting plants that you would have some material investment in there, but you can do it with like a window pane and straw bales. You can, um, last class, Mano shared her hydraulic self-opening cold frame that we have. Um, I think you shared a link to buying that mechanism, right? And we could reshare that for people who are interested. And like what I do is super basic and easy. I use a sheet. I have like a couple old sheets and I just put sheets on things. Um, and it usually works. You know, sometimes if the sheet touches a leaf, that leaf might get damaged. But if the roots are okay and the stalk is okay, it'll be okay if a couple leaves get frostbitten and, and you have to pull them off. Um, I, I'll I also agree. say like hail is something to think about. We do get hail in the springtime and that can be really damaging to your cute little lettuces or um, Swiss chard and spinach, right? Like you can still eat torn up leaves, but it doesn't look as pretty as pictures and it will, it's, it can attract pests or mold and start problems because it is a damaged part of the plant. Another um, cover that I like to use is, you know, the bubble wrap. Sometimes you receive things wrapped in bubble wrap, any color of bubble wrap. And I, I save those pieces and I put them on top if I have, if I know it's going to be a big frost or big snow and I want to protect my, my greens, I put a layer of fabric and then I put a layer of this bubble wrap. Oh, I like that idea. I have not seen that before. I'm going to try it. Or, or I use uh, agricultural fabric and on top of that, I will use uh, this, this queen or you know, any sheet plastic or even mm -hmm. a bag mm -hmm. on top. So the more layers you have, the more you gain uh, in temperature. Yep. And then also protecting your plants is hardening them off. So if we're starting seeds in a protected area, a little greenhouse or a little dome um, where you could start a bunch of seeds on a tray, when we're transplanting those into the garden, we have to harden them off, um, especially in a climate like ours where our days are warm and then our nights are really cold, right? Um, you wanna make sure those plants are getting acclimated before you just toss them into the soil. Um, and let them fend for themselves. You can definitely do that. You'll have less success. Um, so hardening off is a really easy process where you're just slowly getting them acclimated to the outdoor temperatures and the sunlight by bringing your pots physically outdoors for a couple hours the first day, a couple more hours the second day, eventually over the course of a week to two weeks to three weeks, depending on what you want to do, um, leaving them out overnight. And then eventually you can transplant them once they're acclimated to that temperature. And that, that said, Linnea, who's the food manager at the Hunger Coalition, she confessed that she doesn't have time to do that. So she takes things from the greenhouse, puts them out in the field, and they grow. So, you know, um, it, if you want to baby each little start because you only have a few, uh, do take precautions. If you're doing on a, on a larger scale, then you may, you know, plants will protect themselves. If you have a, a dense planting, the family protects, <laughs> the plants mm -hmm. protect each other. So. And, and stressing plants uh, isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? Like plants need a little bit of stress so that they build vigor and um, they kind of thrive. You don't, like if people have experienced starting seeds, if those seeds are completely protected, um, they're not going to make strong plants. You actually want a little bit of movement. You want a little bit of stress because that creates healthy, robust plants. Um, so I get what Linnea is getting at. Like if you don't have time and you have tons of starts, you're actually probably going to make really strong, healthy plants doing that. Um, and just plugging our seed library, save those seeds because then we're getting hardy bio regionally acclimated seeds that we can then um, share with more community members. 
I see someone is asking uh, when we harden off our plants, if we put them outside only when it's sunlight or even if it's dark outside. Um, I tend to do at the beginning, I do only sunlight, like right now when I take my babies out, it's only during sunlight and for a short period. And if it's um, cloudy and dark, um, it might also be colder. There may be a draft, there may be snow coming or hail coming. So you, it's not that I would not put them out when it's dark, but you want that the plant to acclimate to receiving direct sunlight. You want them also to acclimate to uh, the wind and, and the cold temperatures. And so you just have to be mindful of the different factors and know what, what the plant can sustain. Mm -hmm. at, at that stage. And then I see Mike did add the cold frame hydraulic mechanisms that we talked about last time to the chat. So anyone who's interested in those, the links to those as well as a DIY cold frame are in the chat. So thanks for sharing those, Mike. It's awesome resource these, to have. These arms work really well with the corrugated um, polycarbonate sheets, which are very light. It, it's like it's like a corrugated plas uh, cardboard, but it, it's plastic. It's clear plastic, and it lets the light through. But it's corrugated, so it adds insulation also, and it's very light. So it's 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 expensive, but it, it's really worth it, and it lasts a while. And it'll last a while. It's not going to go bad. It's not going to be replaced yearly. Um, yeah, and we didn't it's mention been there ten years, and it, it's still in good shape. It's great. Uh, we mentioned earlier that water insulates, air also insulates, and that's probably part of why that bubble wrap is so helpful because those bubbles have air in them. So air will hold temperature um, better than not having air in there, but water will definitely hold temperature because the mass is more. So it has more mass and to hold that temperature. You have a cold frame or, or a greenhouse. If you leave jugs or big containers of water in the cold frame or in the greenhouse, that water accumulates the heat and it, it uh, tempers your, your space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people might see like on the north facing wall of a greenhouse that would be covered in like black water bladders and that's to catch that heat and store it overnight. So that once um, the sun goes down and it's no longer being hit by the sun, it's letting the heat slowly out as it comes back to room temperature. So it's thermal mass. It's a really incredible way of um, low energy, low cost and fossil fuel free heating, which is incredible. Um, okay, so our next thing is we're gonna get into all the fun plants that you can grow. So we'd love to hear from you. Drop it in the chat if you want to. What's your favorite cool season crop? Um, I'll claim mine. Mine is all day peas. I love peas of all types. It's my favorite plant to grow. I think they're beautiful and I love to eat them. And I seem to never be able to grow enough of them to actually fulfill how much I want to eat. So what about you, Mano? What's your favorite cool season crop? Garlic. <laughs> I plant it in the fall in October and it peaks through, not through the snow, but it, it, it peaks soon after the snow uh, melts and um, it's it's no maintenance, very low maintenance, and um, it's 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 so joyful for me. So let's go through. Oh, I'm sorry. Anne asked if we if we have the chart. So Anne, we actually have um, kind of a better chart that has even more information on it. Um, I I don't know if Mike has that. Mike, if you want to, it's on the Five B Resilience Garden website and it's the first gardening resource um, and it's actually a like a pdf excel document that has i think like 40 plants on it already so hopefully if he can't get that i will drop it into the chat during our q a session at the end of this um but so let's just kind of walk through this chart a little bit because there is a lot of information here um so we essentially wanted to give you all some ideas of plants that you could grow as any annuals or biennials. So annuals are plants that grow from seed to reproduction in one year. Um, biennials go from seed to reproduction in two years. So like carrots, 
they will need to be either replanted or left in the soil over the winter, and then they go to seed the next year. But for your consumption, you don't want them to actually go to seed. You're going to eat them um, before they get into that reproductive state. So over here, we have a list of um, annuals and biannuals, and we determined, we, we grouped a couple, and in the full spreadsheet that Mike just posted in the chat, they're not grouped like this, but we did it so we could fit as many as possible on a single slide. Um, but as you can see, like we say whether or not you should be direct seeding, which is DS, or transplanting, which is T, or either. So some crops are fine, whether they're direct seeded or transplanted. Um, bless you, Mano. <laughs> I saw you, I didn't hear you, but I am gonna still bless you for that one. I am, I unmuted myself to sneeze. <laughs> that was very polite of you, thank you. Um, so our next category is hardy, semi-hardy and tender. And I think this is maybe a little bit more in depth than transplant or direct seed. Um, so we wanted to kind of go through this and talk to you about like, what's the difference between semi-hardy, tender, and hardy? Semi-hardy means that it can handle low temps and light frost, but it can get damaged. It can get killed if the soil temperature goes too low. Where tender, like leaf lettuces and head lettuces, those, if they get cold, you're not going to be able to eat those leaves again. So that means they're tender. They still like cold, cool soil temps, but they cannot handle low temperatures. Where hardy, those plants can hardy freezing temperatures. Um, a difference between a hard frost and a light frost. Uh, a light frost would be just below uh, freezing temperature. So maybe to 29, 28, not more. But um, and and uh, a hard frost, what we call a hard frost, and hardy plants can survive a hard frost would would be you know less than four degrees below. Mm -hmm. And this is for me, I, I really like to think about it of like if anyone's ever sat and watched your thermometer in the morning time, you might notice that overnight it will stay above freezing. And then right at dawn is when it drops and dips. And that's when you should be very, very much paying attention because your tender plants, even if it's like 35 at night, it might drop to 31 for an hour at you know 6 a.m., 7 a.m., depending on what time of year. And that itself can kill off lettuces. Um, it can freeze radishes, you know, so you want to protect those when that comes. So I think it's a good practice to protect those tender crops like every night during the springtime because it most often gets below that temperature. Um, and it's just a good practice. I find it easier to do it repetitively than to only do it when it's gonna get cold because I'm I will definitely forget and lose everything. Um, so and those are especially if you live in an area like like me, I'm close to a canyon. So the cold draft comes down the canyon. The cold draft come from high areas to low areas in the morning. And 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 that air that mass of air is very cold and moist and it deposits frost on your vegetables. So if, if you're in an area where you know you have a draft like that, you're not protected, then your plant can suffer from the frost. So just having a layer of fabric on top of them protects them mm -hmm. from that frost. And then uh, other things just to kind of mention on this chart is things like onions and shallots. Uh, we say that you can direct seed them or transplant them we transplanting can't you can transplant your actual seed like once it's grown a little bit and transplant it but you can also buy onion bulbs or shallot bulbs that are more mature and transplant those into your garden so that's like similar to um well i guess i don't know if it's similar to anything is it <laughs> i was gonna say leeks but it's not you don't do that with leeks for onions and shallots they call them sets onion sets so they're, they grew, they started growing and then they're kind of dormant or a little drier and, and they call them sets and then you can transplant them. 
But if, you, if you're growing onion, you have to, from seed, you have to start them early in January, indoors. And it also, it depends on the variety. There are some onions that will mature faster and then some that need a really long season. So that's where it's really important to look at that variety and days to maturity. Because I've definitely grown onions from seed starting them in February here, but they're the small, you know, sweet onions. I'm not getting a big, large yellow storage crop because our season just doesn't allow for that unless you're um, manipulating your climate and keeping them in a greenhouse or something like that. Um, I grow leeks from seed every year too. They're not on this list because I learned they are perennial, which I thought was really interesting. Um, they sprout little babies off of them that are good every year after year, which is really fun. Um, we also, oh, Linda has a question about scallions. Yeah, so scallions are like, you could plant scallions um, following the same onion and shallot list here they're just going to grow a lot quicker because they're not forming a bulb. You're harvesting the green of them, but they are also annuals. They will reseed themselves. Anything you want to add about scallions, Manel? Well, so, some kinds of green onions are perennials. So some, some are right. annuals, some are perennials. So right. I, I, grow, I grow mostly the perennials, like the walking onions, the e Egyptian onions and Japanese onions. And, and uh, they're a no brainer. They, they just come back from year to year. If you don't pull the roots out. Right. Other fun things. One thing maybe to note in this plant chart is that we also noted that things will bolt in heat. So while these are great crops to grow in the cooler season, when the warmth comes June, July, sometimes May, like I know a few years ago, we had some really hot weather in May and I had some stuff bolt. Um, a lot of these cool season crops will bolt and you can, like Mano mentioned earlier, mitigate that by cooling them off, whether you're shading them, watering them with cold water, um, you can pluck the bolting heads in hopes that it will stay vegetative, like trim the top off if you don't want it to bolt, but it most likely will keep bolting, but it is a way to do it. Um, some of these plants, like especially lettuce, gets really bitter when it bolts. So it's no longer going to be edible where there's varieties of broccoli that are actually sold as sprouting broccoli. So they will bolt instead of forming a big head. It's kind of like broccolini. They have lots of little bolts and that's what you want from it, right? So there is very variety specific until like this is going to bolt and taste really bad versus you actually want this to bolt and create your vegetable out of that. So, and you also want to uh, do successive planting because you know they're going to, to bolt, right? So you, you plant your greens every three weeks every two to three weeks, you plant new ones if you want to have a continuous uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, same with radishes too. Like they grow really quickly. So if you plant, let's say a hundred radishes tomorrow or in early April, you're gonna harvest a hundred radishes at the same time. You might be able to give it a week or so on either end to extend it, but it's much better practice for continuous eating to plant 10 radishes one day, five days later, plant 10 more radishes. And it is more work, but that's how you're going to be able to consistently eat out of your garden um, throughout the summer is thinking about secession. And some plants need it and other plants don't, right? Like you might not secession um, Brussels sprouts because they're going to take your whole garden season anyways, and they're going to store okay when you harvest them all at the end of the fall. Right. But if you wanted to eat arugula all summer long, you're going to have to plant repeatedly and probably go from a sunny spot in your garden to a shady spot in your garden um, in the heat of the summer to ensure that you can get that crop throughout the year. Someone's asking about broccolini. Uh, you can buy seeds that are called broccolini. So you know that they're more appropriate. Yeah. Or they're called sprouting broccoli sometimes. Um, Chinese sprouting broccoli is a term that I've heard before. Um, and then some people's method for broccolini would be that you would allow your full broccoli head to form. You would cut the head off, but leave everything else. And then if you have enough nutrients and time in your soil, 
nutrients in your soil and time in the world, um, it would sprout again and that could be harvested as broccoli. So it won't be as big and beautiful as one single head, but you'll get a lot of smaller heads, which can be really fun to do. I like to do that because it gets more out of the broccoli plant because like broccoli is a big plant and it takes a long time and a lot of nutrients. So you plant it and it just sits there for months. So if I can get more out of that single plant, that's what I like to do. Um, doesn't really work as well with cabbage or Brussels sprouts to do that method though. And make sure you cover them with fabric uh, because otherwise the animals will come and eat them or the butterflies will come and lay their eggs and you'll have worms on your broccoli. So yeah, we've, brassicas have a lot of pests. Um, so a lot of people recommend just keeping them covered throughout the whole season. We have leaf miners, we have cabbage moths, um, all those things can make it a really frustrating plant, plant family to grow. But I, I, they're my favorite. I, well, I shouldn't say that. I said peas are my favorite earlier, but I really like eating brassicas. I do not love growing brassicas. Um, they're hard to grow and I don't have a lot of space in my garden. So it's very limited. Any other things you maybe want to talk about on these, this group of plants, or should we move on to the perennials? Yeah, that's, that's cool. Okay. So our next um, plant list, and on the list that Mike shared, these are all on one list together. We just broke them up for these slides, so it's less information to take in on per slide. Um, so these are the perennial vegetables, and you'll see my little... Uh, <laughs> This is my note to us. There's a lot more perennial plants. Like we did not include a lot of perennial herbs on here. Um, there's also a lot of perennial fruits like raspberries and shrubs that are not included on this list. So this is specifically about those perennial vegetables. And flowers too. There are a lot of yeah. perennial flowers and it's good in your garden to have a mix of perennials and um, annuals. And uh, the perennials come up early. So you want them in, in, in the garden mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. to have greens early in the season. Yep. And on, on the right here is a Japanese onion that I, that comes back year to year. I just leave the roots there and it, it one year it grew to five feet tall and it's so spectacular. I only eat it when it's small, but then I let some go really tall and it's just spectacular in the garden. And at the mm -hmm. top, the stems are these little tiny onions and at some point these heads become so heavy it they bend down and they go into they hit the soil and then they they start another plant that's why they're called walking onions because they're they're making other babies they they look like they're walking mm -hmm. So and so you can see down here, we included some more of those allium types like chives, walking onions, garlics, and leeks. So those are technically perennials. Um, they will, like if you were to leave a garlic bulb in the ground, it will reproduce itself. Um, it's helpful to break it up and spread it out so you get bigger um, cloves of garlic forming. But like I have a couple cloves or buds sorry, I'm like losing my words, bulbs of garlic that I planted a couple of years ago and I never harvested. I just kind of let them spread out. I actually use them mostly for scapes. So the whole part of the garlic is edible. Most of us just eat the garlic bulb, but the green garlic before, like right when it's sprouting, that's delicious and you can eat that. Um, and then they grow this really cute swirl of, uh, it's called a scape. And actually on a commercial level, people will harvest the skates to promote the bulb growth or the clove growth. Um, but those skates are delicious and they're one of my favorite plants to eat um, in like June because it's green and pungent and it makes amazing pesto. It's awesome on the grill. So I think the thing I love most about perennials is that they make you kind of experiment and eat things a little differently than just like buying an onion at the grocery store right? It, it makes you step out of your comfort zone and try new things. And they look really cool. Um, and as a lazy gardener, I like stuff that just keeps cr making more and more of itself. Um, so we also included like Jerusalem artichoke and horseradish. Big notice that these will spread easily. If you don't want them to take over a full garden bed, contain them because they're invasive. I like to call them opportunistic instead of invasive. 
um, because they're edible and wildlife likes them. They're also pretty. Um, Jerusalem artichoke and horseradish both have really beautiful blooms. So they serve more purposes than just food. So I definitely recommend them for people. Um, I would say Jerusalem artichokes are a little less known, but it is a native edible tuber to North America, which I think is really interesting. Chives is also a nice flowering plant. It makes a beautiful purple uh, uh, ball of, of little flowers and they attract mm -hmm. pollinators. So I, I let them be. Some people yep. say, oh, cut them off. I let them be. <laughs> They're also edible and they create seeds, right? So there's so many different ways. Like a lot of people um, will dig up chives and separate them to grow clumps, but you can also grow them from seed, right? So I, I think they're really unique in that way. Um, I love eating chai blossoms. I make a chai blossom, both a vinegar that is beautiful and pink. And then I also make a salt with it. So I'll dry the chai blossoms and mix it with like a pink salt. And it's like a lo lovely salt to use. And it just, it brightens up your plate in the winter time. And I like that a lot. But it's um, another plant that you want to contain somewhat because it can multiply. And if it recedes itself, it can take over your garden. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Every year I, I need to remove some and share it at the plant exchange. Asparagus, I think, is a lot of people's kind of favorite perennial. A lot of us are familiar with asparagus. We get really excited about asparagus season. Um, asparagus will start poking out through the ground in a couple of weeks between early May, you know, late April, early May to June. It really depends on the temperature. Um, the thing about asparagus is it takes a couple years to establish. So if you want asparagus in your garden, plant it as soon as you can, because you need a couple years before you're ready to harvest it. And I made the mistake four years ago to not plant it. And now I still don't have asparagus and I want to plant it, but I'm not going to be here a couple more years. So I'm still waiting patiently to plant it. And you probably don't want asparagus in your vegetable garden. Actually, it's, it's, a lot of the perennials, uh, it's best to keep them aside. As the ones that multiply from their roots, because they they will, uh, you know, they'll come out. They'll send shoots everywhere, and and they do better if they're you know by themselves. So I I see that as a plant that you can have if you have a lot of space, and and a dedicated space. In a couple of years, I hope to share with you an experiment that went really well, where I did a full polyculture with asparagus in the center of it, with rhubarb and strawberries. I've been doing a lot of research and I want to test it to see if it works, because it'd be fun to have it incorporated with other plants instead of just having one big asparagus patch. Because um, asparagus, you do at the end of the season, you let it fern out where it grows tall and it creates these cute little berries, but that's part of it. And for some people, a really big patch of that might not look too appealing, where if it's incorporated with other plants, you might get a little bit more of a dynamic landscape planting. So I'm going to be experimenting when I get my new house, maybe we'll see. Um, when I have a garden that I know I own long-term, I'm going to try all that and hopefully share some exciting um, findings with everybody in a couple of years. So um, rhubarb, I think is the other plant. I include it as a vegetable because it, it's technically a leaf that we, well, we eat the stem of the leaf. So it, most people think of it as a fruit, but it's not like a cane or a bush fruit. Um, or shrub fruit or tree. So I wanted to put it here. Um, it, uh, people grow it really well around here. You can't start it from seed because it is a hybrid. So you need to get a, a, something that's dug up from another garden or from a nursery where you're transplanting it. Um, they do grow prolifically around here. So like contain it if you don't want it to spread out and take over. Um, also be aware that the leaves are toxic. So don't eat them. And a lot of people still avoid putting them in the compost pile for that reason. Um, I think- There's a question about uh, starting leeks. Do you start them indoors? I've, I yeah. tried them once and I was not successful. So I'm, not, I'm not an expert on leeks. I have grown them for three years now. I definitely start them indoors. Um, I meant to throw, add a picture up to this slideshow, but I didn't get it downloaded in time. But when you plant like onions, leeks, chives, you would do um, a bigger container 
like a four to six inch container. And then you plant a lot of seeds into that. And they're all sprout up as these cute little single sprouts. Um, and once they're sprouted, you actually break them off and plant just the, the individual plant with a little root on it. And that's what you would transplant into your garden. Um, well, you can- chart, The chart here says direct seed, but just know that everything that says direct seed, you can break the rule and start them indoors anyway. But you have to be really careful at not disturbing the root when you transplant them. And you have to um, transplant them when they're still small. You have to transplant them at the right time and not delay. So what I do is I would use a container. Let's say this is a cup, but I would use a plastic cup, cut the bottom, put it upside down so I have a little cone and, and start my starts in there so there's no bottom. And I just sit, sit them on a tray. And then when they're ready to transplant, I just slide the cup up and, and let plop the whole thing down into the ground. And that's how I minimize the, the transplant uh, shock. And I should have clarified this from- have, have a long tap root. So you don't want to disturb that long tap root. And I should have clarified this. The transplant and direct seed for perennials was a little bit different. Um, because a lot of perennials are things that you take a cutting of or a slip of and transplant it where you wouldn't do that with a leak. Like leaks are you usually started from seed and then they can be transplanted or they can be direct seeded, but you're not often getting like a leak plant that someone gives you and then replanting it where garlic, you're often getting a garlic bulb and replanting it or um, chives, you can start them from seed, but most often you're getting a clump of chives and transplanting that into your garden. So that's where uh, perennial and annuals are very different in what it means to direct seed versus transplant versus actually in your garden um, annuals will, some will do much better direct seeded like peas and radishes than transplanting, but Minot's technique with um, the lack of bottom on a cup will work well for those direct seed plants. Um, so you have to be concerned about what's the depth of, of the roots. Plants like chive have roots that are not so deep compared to you know, a carrot or, or a, a leek or a, a comfrey or you know, other plants that have really, really long, deep mm -hmm. tap roots. Yeah. And sometimes it's also about like the, the plant's likelihood of establishing root rot. So like peas are one of those things that a lot of people don't like to transplant because root rot can establish really easily on them. Um, but a lot of people have success transplanting them. I've transplanted peas with lots of success. Mm -hmm. However, I must say that it wasn't worth the trouble because they did not produce earlier. <laughs> right. Yeah. So transplanting can shock the plants um, and they take a while to kind of bounce back. And you might actually see that, like Mano mentioned, you plant it, you, you started a pea plant in March in your greenhouse and let it grow. And you transplanted it in April. And that same week in April, you planted from seed next to it in the garden. Those plants in the long run might end up doing the exact same. And that's, you kind of just have to experiment with that and figure out for yourself um, which ones work and don't. Uh, Anne asks, my rhubarb hasn't done well here. Do you think I can move it this spring to a better sunlight area or should I wait till fall? I'd say, yeah, definitely move it in the springtime. Yeah, before it starts growing too much. Mm -hmm. As soon as you can dig it out. And I, I don't like rhubarb, I'll own that. So I don't grow it. Mano, do you have any tips for soil for rhubarb? Like, does it like? I don't. I don't know. I don't grow rhubarb myself. I think it it likes a. a oh no, I'm not sure. I'd rather. I better not say anything. I, I'm not sure how to do rhubarb. I don't want to put more work on Sherry Cray, but Sherry grows very successful rhubarb. Um, if you all know Sherry Cray of Cray's Market and Garden, she might be a good person to ask about rhubarb because I know she grows a lot of it and it grows really well for her. Um, so she might be somebody to get some more hands-on experience with rhubarb to share that and information. 
Kristen Fletcher from the Haley Library also uh, has a successful rhubarb plantation and she often divides it up and gives it to other people. Nice. Yeah, that's very helpful. So like we, we mentioned have, earlier. We usually have rhubarb starts at our plant exchange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's our next slide. Oh, no, we're, we're, we're still on a calendar. So um, we also have these amazing planting calendars for people who actually want to see like, when do I start a seed? When do I transplant in, into my garden? So we've shared this resource in past um, courses and we just have a little snippet of like what that looks like for cool season or springtime gardening. Um, so the full calendar is available on our website. But as you can see here, we will say like, what could you actually plant this week? Well, it's the third week of March. So you could, you could start seeding onions and green onions and cilantro in your greenhouse, right? Then if you look down here, those are transplanted into the garden the first week of May. Um, so you, that's how this calendar is working. So if we start to look at, oh, well, when can I first get kale going in my greenhouse? Um, this calendar I think was created by Linnea Petty with the Hunger Coalition. Um, so like experiment for yourself and see if this is true or not. There's flexibility on either end of this as well. Um, so she's starting kale in her greenhouse in April and transplanting it out at the end of April. So a short growth there. And late, later in June, you, you can see that she sees it directly into the soil. Second week of June. Oh, sorry. I did that thing with my, my mouse again. Second week of June, she's she's seeding kale in directly in the garden. Mm -hmm. And you can also notice here of her secessions, like carrots are being directly seeded into the garden the last week of April. Then again, the second week of May, right? And that's allowing them to get multiple harvests throughout the season of those carrots. We've got a couple questions coming in the chat. Oh, yeah, that, it's that, a really that chart is available on on our in, in the folder that yeah, uh... Mike dropped the link to those in the chat. So we have one in Spanish and then two in English. One English version that you see here was created by Linnea. I think Mano created the other planting calendar. Yeah, it's my so... personal planting calendar versus Linnea's at the Hunger Coalition. I, I don't do successive planting and she does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yes, it's an awesome picture of a carrot, but we could pick apart what happened during this planting to make this carrot, right? Um, some people might say you should have thinned it so they didn't grow so close. Maybe it hit a rock and that's what sent this cute little thing hugging the other one. Um, I love seeing stuff like this. When I harvest stuff out of my garden that does something cute, I find it really charming. Other people might be annoyed that they spent all this time babying this carrot to have it only produce this little nub, right? Um, gardening is kind of in the hands of the gardener and how they perceive the world. And I think Manoa and I are both good representations of when we make mistakes, we make the most of it and learn from it. And we're not too hung up on yield and efficiency and productivity. We like beauty and we like to eat delicious things. And we like to see bugs and birds in our garden. And I love to experiment. Mm -hmm. and observe I like to observe what's happening and that's how we learn by by observing like every morning now I go out and I observe what's what's peeking out you know what's what's coming what bugs are, are showing what yeah what what do the dead leaves look like you know just observing oh my dead leaves are starting to get too wet and too moldy it's time to take them out so that molds don't set on my garlic mm -hmm. you know it's it's a nice meditation mm -hmm. observing nature it is very nice so Mano, i just looked at the clock we're already at one o'clock i know we've been going through and answering questions as we go but i think it'd be a nice time to skip ahead a little bit talk about our upcoming events and the survey and then jump into questions for anyone who wants to stay on past one and chat with us so i'm gonna go through these couple slides really quickly and ignore them um we have some awesome upcoming events, so please mark your calendar and join us. We'll be at the Haley Public Library virtual webinar on March 25th and April 15th. 
you can sign up for those at Kristen Fletcher at HaleyPublicLibrary.org. Um, we also have an April 22nd composting workshop. We're still working out those details, but it will be a hands-on workshop at the Building Material Thrift Store where we will make a compost set up for them. Um, and then April 24th is our first seed and plant exchange at the Upper Bigwood River Grange. So that'll be a place where you can get your hands on some of the crops that we're, we talked about here today. A lot of those perennials, culinary plants, herbs, flowers, all sorts of things. So and all the seeds from the seed library. Yeah, and bring your plants. Um, it's fun. We share them. It's tailgate style to be mindful of COVID. So people are setting up their vehicles and sharing whatever they have. We may have some farmers come and sell plants at that time. If not this one, then they will be there at the, the May event that will take place the last weekend of May. Um, so last plug for us is that if you could please take a survey, letting us know how we did today, this QR code, if you hold your camera up to it, you'll be taken to that really quick survey. We'll also send a follow-up that includes some of the resources, a recording of this webinar, a survey link, and the slide deck. So you will receive all those things from us um, tomorrow. Go to 5bresiliencegardens.org to get some of our resources. We have a lot of amazing resources created by gardeners in our community on there. Um, and also join our Facebook group to share information with your fellow gardeners. So with that, we will officially go into our Q&A session. If anyone has stuff we did not yet cover, um, I'll look through the chat and I will stop sharing my screen so we can all see each other. I know we went through a lot of information, so. Are you, are you stopping the recording now? No, we have been recording the Q&As just because there's so much great information in there that we want to make sure we capture it. Okay. <laughs> So if anyone has any questions, you may add them to the chat or you can come off camera or mute and ask us. Um, we're happy to like answer specific questions about your own garden or more general questions of like, what about a kohlrabi that we never talked about yet, but it was on our chart. The one question I have is I really need plants that are going to go from either germination to um, harvest really in a short period because my my um, growing period is so short. Do you have a good resource for finding which varieties um, are the best for that? Yeah, there's a document that was produced by the University of Idaho. It's called Growing at High Altitude. Actually, there are two documents called Growing at High Altitude. But any or any book that's that's covers the topic growing at high altitude will will give you uh, that information. But the, there are documents from the University of Idaho. They were produced I don't know maybe ten years ago, and and there may be new varieties coming. So when when you uh, look for seeds, you you can look for seeds that are you know especially. Uh, short season that mature in a short time or look for something that says it's been uh, done at high altitude and I encourage you to use local seeds because our, our seeds adapt just the fact that I plant something and it survives in my garden means that the seed has adapted to my environment and is is happy to grow in the temperatures that we have here so if you use local seeds, and we have plenty of seeds at, here at the Wood River Seed Library uh, that are, have been grown locally and oh, that great. are adapted to, to our climate. And, and once you plant something in, at your altitude, if you see, save your own seeds, they will be adapted to your climate. That's okay. great advice. Thank you. Um, I did add there is a link to a Dropbox folder that has all of those University of Idaho publications. They also have like fruit trees, um, shrubs, all sorts of different, um, I think each different category of plants has a different one. But like Mano said, like these were created over 10, about 10 years ago. Um, new varieties have come on the market. Our climate has also shifted. Let's just be realistic about that of like, the varieties that are available to us today that work are going to be different than they were 10 years ago because we are getting warmer summers. Um, 
we're not getting as cold of winters. We're also not getting as much snow and the snow insulate. So there's like mm. tricks to that with climate change um, and weather changes. Um, so it's not a perfect system, but. And, and these documents will name varieties that have been developed commercially, mm -hmm. but there's nothing like a seed that was developed by a home gardener that have say that has saved seeds or you know clubs of gardeners that live at high altitude that the gardeners have saved their own seeds and have developed the adaptation for 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 their seeds and they don't and oftentimes these seeds don't have a name right they're just the right. treasures of a region so it, it's so important that we develop our own seed bank and our ability to save our own seeds because they they have so much information in the seeds that allow them to survive to climate change. Mm -hmm. the seeds have a memory of thousands of years. And when the climate changes, they can go back to their memory and and express themselves as something that will survive well in your area. And and once you do that, make sure you save your seeds and, and they're they're a treasure. Seriously, they're, they will mm -hmm. save it. In the and this is where experimentation really matters because we like that variety that you're choosing, it might not yet be adapted or it might not be tested by University of Idaho, but like test it yourself. And if you're successful, that's, that's what Mino's talking about. Like you're acclimating that variety to our climate and that is really valuable. I saw you wave your hand, Carol, go ahead. Yeah. Um, hey, I know last year, um, I mean, it's great to have the resources online and stuff, but last year when we did this or sometime in the midst of when we were staying at home entirely, um, you gave, uh, Amy, you gave a little tour of your greenhouse um, that's there by your house. And I still wanna come and see that. So I don't know, I mean, I would just put that out as a suggestion, hopefully this summer that we could do some little impromptu garden greenhouse tours. Um, that would be great just, you know, and maybe it's scheduled or maybe it's not or, or whatever, but um, it would just be kind of fun to see that. I'm still dreaming of a little greenhouse, so. Um, I think garden tours are definitely something we wanna do this summer. I'll share kind of maybe like bad, sad news. We did not keep the greenhouse running this winter. Um, mostly because we th we've been in contract to buy a house since November. So when November came, our intention was to not live here until April. So we were like, well, there's no point in keeping it going. It is costly. Like we had a hot water heater that was running it. So we saw a big increase in our energy prices last year. So we made the decision to not keep it active this year. Um, I still have like bunching onions and carrots and mallow growing. It's just not very pretty right now, um, but I want to kind of recreate that greenhouse and hopefully our new home, which hopefully we'll move into sometime, um, <laughs> ideally by the end of March, yeah. and April. We have to go beyond this idea of, oh, it's not pretty enough to show. <laughs> Gardens don't look pretty. Gardens have to be messy. I agree with that. And I, as you all know, I love my messy garden, but my greenhouse is like lots of dead plants and cobwebs right now. Well, well, we learn, we can learn from that too. That's so true. We, we all have to be uh, willing to share what works and what doesn't work. And even if your greenhouse is not in full production, there's the greenhouse is still there and it still shows what, what happens in a greenhouse that is not heated with your water heater. So we Thank have you for to that. beyond that shyness of showing, oh, it's not nice enough to show, wait, wait till next month. No, you, people need to know how to start a greenhouse. What, okay. They need to know what it looks like at this time of year. Then maybe I'll go share it right now. But first, before we get onto that, because I might actually walk outside and show it to you all right now, because um, but Anne asked, I have bulbs in my veg garden. Any tips on how to deal with bulb greens while I want to plant veggies? I'm not sure what the question is. How to deal with bulb greens? I'm reading it. And Anne, if you want to come off mute and um, 
speak to your question more, you're welcome to, but I'm reading it as like, she's got a garden bed and she has bulbs in it and they're going to sprout green. And she wants to also plant vegetables. And I think for me, I would say like spacing, just make sure you're giving your plants space so that they can grow out and expand. Um, you can also cut the bulb greens once they bloom and are past that point. But I think you're talking about like in the vegetative state, the other thing to think about when you're thinking about like plant guilds, bulbs serve a purpose, right? They are suppressing weeds around them because they take up surface space. So you don't want to plant other vegetables that do the same thing, right? You're not going to plant garlic and carrots or beets or radishes next to your bulb because they're going to try to take up the same space. But if you plant peas, they go up, right? Or if you plant kale, that goes up. That doesn't take up the same surface or the same soil space. And that's what a guild is. Like you can actually have multiple plants growing in a tight area as long as each plant has its own function. So that's what I would think about is like, what can you grow close to those bulbs that's not taking up the soil space that the bulbs need? Um, and then also making sure there's enough fertility in there to support everything. So like adding a layer of compost so that you can have bulbs and multiple plants growing in the same bed. And you have you have to know that you're if you're talking about flower bulbs, uh, once the flowers are spent, like daffodils or tulips, uh, you need to let the greens be there so that the bulbs will survive till the next year. If you cut the greens to the ground after the flower is spent, you're basically killing your bulb. But you can cut them back a little bit not all the way to the ground, but you can trim them down like one third of the way to give a little bit less shading. Um, you can also think about like layering your bed from north to south, right? So if you have like a back row of bulbs that bloom in the back, you can plant in front of them and they're not going to shade a little tiny seedling behind them, right? So there's, it's a very like relative space thinking. Um, I guess spatial would be the correct term to use, but there's a lot of ways, like we talked about earlier with vertical gardening, like your bulbs are not going to get, I guess irises get relatively tall, but most bulbs are short. So what can you grow that grows taller than them? So could you have a trellis with peas on it at the back and some bulbs and some lettuces planted in between? Like I would say, absolutely. Does that answer your question, Anne? Yeah, I've in the past, um... I've taken the greenery, which I've been told don't cut it, and I've wrapped it up and tied it with rubber bands. But it almost it's almost there till July. And I just, you know, want to yeah, the put green, other things in. You want to leave the greens for maybe a month. After that, you can take them out. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you. You know, it's it's like nursing a baby, you know. The longer you leave them, the better. But after a certain period of time it's okay you know okay the, the first the first little while after is is the more important than you know in the long term thank you thanks for the question and i would also just like add to that that um companion planting and polyculture whatever forest gardening whatever you want to call it like it's very much about experimentation not everything is going to be successful that the books tell you to try. You're going to have some failures and that's just kind of part of the process. Um, and then you'll, what, what you'll do in that experimentation is find the things that work really well. Um, and that's what you can lean into and duplicate, but try as broad as you want. Like try as many types of crops with your um, bulbs as you can, and then narrow it down from there of what works really well for you and your garden with those bulbs that you have. And someone is 